Welcome to another episode of London Lights. Today on our program, we have a very interesting story to tell, talk about. And to tell about, it's author Brian Martin, affectionately known as Chip to his buddies like me, who played hockey together. And hey, Chip, how'd you get that nickname anyway? Oh, that's a long story. You don't have enough time for it. But it it, it, it had something to do with a, an uncanny resemblance to a chipmunk and its cheeks. But let's not go there. <laughs> okay, I hear you. Well, Brian, as an author, you're a former London Free Press reporter. You're an award-winning journalist for more than 40 years. You've told the stories of southwestern Ontario relating to all kinds of subjects and stories of London. Uh, your recent book, The Underground Railroad, or From the Underground Railroad to Rebel Refuge, takes place here in London. You've also written two true crime books, several biographies and baseball histories, and you're a member of two historical societies. Brian Martin lives in London, Ontario. Brian, welcome to the program. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> We're going to talk about your incredible book, recently written and recently released, From Underground Railroad to Rebel Refuge. Again, a book that I've been uh, reading and I'm fascinated with. I haven't quite completed it, but it's excellent. Uh, but my Thank first you. introduction to you as an author was the uh, story about the remarkable frauds of Julius Melnitzer. He was our London lawyer that committed the biggest bank fraud by an individual in Canadian history up to that point. Yeah, an incredible story. And thank you for telling that story, because at the time, it was the talk of the town for at least a couple of years. What I thought was really neat when I read that book was the very first chapter called The Banker. And let me just read a portion of that, because what I love is the references to uh, sites in London. I could almost feel myself at these spots and visualize what was happening. So the first paragraph, John Graham squinted into the bright sunshine that greeted his eyes as a revolving door ejected him onto Fullerton Street. There's some good writing right away. It was just after 10.15, and the 36-year-old banker set off on what he knew would be a pleasant walk this fine midsummer morning. There was a bounce in his step as he strolled eastward toward busy Richmond Street, the main north-south artery leading to London City Core. Behind him on the second floor of the glass-sided Talbot Center was his desk, covered with the work that he had piled up during his vacation. He'd get back to it soon enough, he thought. Already, I'm reading that book and I'm feeling the city of London. And uh, it is a London story and quite an incredible tale. Uh, the Buxbaum book, I haven't read yet. I hope to read that. And now a book that tells stories about London that probably very few of us have any familiarity with. Thank you for writing these books. But what is it that motivates you and what's the interest in what you do? I think the bottom line is, as a journalist, you tend to be uh, questioning of things and of people. Uh, you like to find things out, and then once you found them out, you like to share them. And uh, the Buxbaum and the Melnitzer were criminal cases, and they were in the courts and that sort of thing. So it was a little easier. The, the material was presented to you. You had to do background research and stuff. But more recently, I've been doing a series of baseball history books, and then this one, From Underground Railroad to Rebel Refuge, and it's about, uh, I, I found some headstones in Woodland Cemetery that were quite intriguing of people who came here and died here. And they came from Charleston, South Carolina. And I that unleashed a torrent of questions in me. Why would anybody come from Charleston, South Carolina to London, Ontario? And furthermore, why would they be buried alongside our most prominent citizens, the Labatt, members of the Labatt beer brewing family, the Harris family, the Beecher family, and other high-ranking, high-profile citizens of London. How did that all happen? So just that started me on a quest that resulted in this book, which uh, I have had my eyes opened unbelievably. I thought I knew uh, London after, you know, 50 years here, but I, I've learned some so much amazing stuff. And I think anyone that uh, picks up the book will have their eyes opened about London's connection to the Civil War. Yeah, I agree. Like as someone who grew up in London, and reading this book, 
my eyes were opened. I mean, I thought I knew London as well, but here is all this fascinating history that I had no idea existed. And it just jumps off the pages. And, and I was quite struck by the whole thing. So I do recommend that Londoners check out your book and check out the stories that are in there. Um, and, and you know, Dan, Dan we, I think I've added to our knowledge because we, all of us in Southwestern Ontario, we're, we're quite familiar that we were uh, the end point of the Underground Railroad, that a lot of black people found, came up here to find freedom and followed the North Star. And we knew that those people came before the Civil War. I got in, once I started researching it, I found that, well, after the war, there were people who had suppressed black people. There were these plantation owners that uh, from South Carolina, there were members of the Ku Klux Klan or Ku Klux as it was then called after the war who settled uh, here and a bunch of Confederate generals settled in Niagara on the lake. And then during the war, we actually housed some Southern families at the Tecumseh House Hotel. There were spires, spies, buyers, plotters, draft dodgers known as skedaddlers. Uh, it was absolutely intriguing. I would have given my eye teeth to be wandering around the streets of London during the Civil War when we were profiting by selling to both sides. Oh, incredible. Well, tell us about Tecumseh House, because I had never heard that name before until I read your book. Was it on the site of the former London Hotel? No, no, it was on the site of where Robert Q. Travel was at the southwest corner of Richmond and York Street. Um, and it was a beautiful hotel. It was built in about 1858. We had a recession that hit and it was they couldn't quite finish it. So it sort of sat almost, sat almost unfinished. And then the, the, they heard that the Prince of Wales was coming to town. So everybody rushed in, finished off the hotel. It was a grand, grand hotel. It had a large image of Tecumseh, the Shawnee Indian chief who fought alongside the British in the lobby. It was for years and years, it was the best hotel in London and one of the largest west of Toronto. Very opulent, very popular. During the Civil War, it was very popular with Confederates. Uh, there were a couple of Confederate families that lived there, reputedly uh, or reportedly uh, family members of General Beauregard from the South were there. Uh, the Confederates, for some reason, liked the Tecumseh House. Um, buyers and spies uh, used it. Uh, meanwhile, the Union was at nearby Arkell's Hotel, which is up uh, to, just a little bit to the north, and it had huge stables. And these buyers were buying horses because armies moved with horses. And so both sides were buying horses. They were buying food to feed their armies and to feed their citizens and cloth and, and uh, all sorts of manufactured goods, uh, guns even, cannons, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, they were basically, we were... Uh, Profited from we profited nicely in London from selling to both sides of the Civil War. After the Civil War, we had a major recession. Well, um, I've always been a history buff, Chip, uh, Brian, ever since I was in grade school. And I've always had the sense, though, that there is so much history that we have, and it can be exciting, but it's not being told in an exciting way. I think, I think what I saw in your book changed that and made me appreciate that our history can be fairly exciting as well, if it's told in the right way by the right person. And I think you've accomplished that for much of your book. Well, thank you very much, you're very kind. Uh, after 41 years of committing journalism the way I did, uh, the writing and the researching part isn't hard. It's st telling the story in a compelling way. And you know, a book, this particular book goes to 108,000 words. Well, there's no newspaper articles that go that that long. So you have to sort of, it's a different technique to tell the story and to spin it out and sort of add the detail that you wouldn't ordinarily in a, in a journalistic piece. So it's been a lot of fun and it's been a learning experience for me. And I've had some wonderful feedback. The early reviews on this uh, from Underground Railroad to a Rebel Refuge have been absolutely outstanding. And so, um, and, and I had a nice launch event and I'm going down to Niagara-on-the-Lake where all these Confederate generals used to hang out. I'm, I'm doing that. Uh, so it's been a lot of fun and a learning experience for me. And I love sharing what I learn and I try to do it in a, a, as readable a way as possible. So you'd agree with me then, Canadian history is not bland and boring. It can be just as exciting as American history. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. It, even more exciting in some ways. One of my favorite parts of the book, the Confederates during the Civil War spent uh, had a $600,000 operation based in Toronto and Montreal. Uh, they were trying to do all sorts of plots and all sorts of mischief on the northern border to detract to distract the northern troops that were beating the southerners in the south 
and they sort of wanted to open sort of a second front. So the the hatch to to kill Abraham Lincoln was was ha the the plot to ha to kill Abraham Lincoln was hatched in Montreal. Uh, the the raid on St Albans, which I love, it's very cinematic. These crazy Confederates march across the border, stay at this hotel overnight. The next afternoon, they say we're de declaring this town is property of the Confederate States of America, and you better get used to it. Meanwhile, the fellow who's announcing this with amazing nerve from the porch of the hotel at three in the afternoon. While he's doing that, all his buddies, his Confederate buddies he's with are robbing the bank, stealing horses, and making their getaway. And they, they got away and they were being pursued by a mob that was led by an off-duty Union soldier, right? Anyway, they were pursued. The minute they got across the border, they said, oh, whew, we're safe now. And they took, they watered the horses and they sat down and everything and they're just sort of relaxing. All of a sudden, the Americans completely ignored the border. The, the Union guys ignored the border, came up and were wrestling with them and dealing with them and trying to arrest them and take them back to the States. And a British Army officer happens along and says, what's all this then? You know, And uh, uh, he says to the Americans, you've crossed the border illegally. I would suggest you go home and we'll deal with these people ourselves. Well, ultimately, they didn't deal with them very harshly because uh, there was a bit of a sympathy in Canada for the South, to be honest, because we were worried that if the South was defeated, the North would then turn its guns north and then try to annex Canada, which uh, had been talked about for quite a while. Well, where are you getting the uh, information for these stories? Because a lot of these stories I read in your book, which were fascinating, I've never heard of them before. Uh, so are you going to newspaper accounts, uh, other books? How do you find this information? Well, for starters, uh, believe it or not, Dan, there have been 60,000 books, six zero, 60,000 books written about the Civil War, about the battles, about the people, about the implications, about all that sort of stuff, 60,000. So I started trying to find books that related to Canada and the Civil War, and there weren't very many of them, but I did find some really good ones dealing with various aspects of it in a sort of a narrow way. Uh, some of the personalities and some of the, the people that went south to, to serve. You know, 40,000 Americans came north, 20,000 went south to serve on both sides of the Civil War. So after the books, I, I looked at newspapers, uh, historic newspapers, which I can access through newspapers.com, uh, documents I found online, uh, research materials in libraries and in archives, that sort of thing. It was pulling together a bunch of stuff um, that was out there, but had never been assembled quite the way that I had by focusing in on Canada and the Civil War and the years leading up to the war, during the war, and after the war. We all know about, you know, the, the being a destination for the Underground Railroad. I think that's fairly well known, although we may not have known the controversy within the Black community about do we want to live in our own self-segregated communities or should we be integrating with existing white communities? That was the major controversy that that racked the the, the 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 black community, and there was some discrimination in places like Chatham. There was a racial discrimination, and even in London, uh, there was a, a plan to set up a separate school for blacks, which never got anywhere. But the, the, it's very interesting. All these aspects, I just decided to put them all together because. Uh, I think people would be astounded to learn that we, it wasn't the, the Civil War wasn't the Americans' war alone. We were involved because we were so close, whether we liked it or not. Uh, we had people go south, people come north, we sold to both sides. I mean, we were intimately involved in the Civil War. And I think a lot of, when we're in schools, we don't appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. Brian, I've got to stop you there. We're going to take a quick break. Viewers, stay with us. We'll be right back to talk with author Brian Martin about his exciting new book, From Underground Railroad to Rebel Refuge. Hang, hang there, we'll be with you in a moment, Brian. All right, viewers, we're back with Brian Martin, the author of a new book, From Underground Railroad to Rebel Refuge. Canada and the Civil War. Now, Brian, in typical gumshoe reporter fashion, uh, I see that many of the photographs in the book, which I really love because I love to see the visual part of these stories you're talking about, that you took the photos and it added so much to me. What was that like? Well, I had to be a bit of a two-way person when I was working for the London Free Press, uh, uh, especially in my early days. I've always liked photography. Um, and I like to arrange, if I can't uh, get them, I just recently arranged some photographs from uh, Dawson City for uh, my next book. 
I, I couldn't get up there just to take some pictures. So I, I, I arrange with, and in the, in the Underground Railroad, the, I've got some a photographer down in South Carolina that took a few images. So, but I like to take my own images because I know the story I'm telling and I know what I want to show. And when I do any presentations, like I did one earlier this week uh, about the book, I, I do them as PowerPoints because the images are so powerful and I'll narrate what people are seeing because I think the, the, the visual image is, is very, very, very important. I know too many authors that figure, well, I'm a writer. That's what I do. And I'm not going to do the other stuff, but I like to tell the, the story visually as well. And I've even recently got into drone photography and there's a, there's a drone picture in my book uh, taken along the Niagara River. Uh, and there's uh, four or five more that uh, I have uh, taken for the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation I, I do with it. So I in, since seriously enjoy photography and I think it helps tell the story. It absolutely does. And uh, you took that picture. I, I love the Niagara area. I'm forever taking a drive along the beautiful Niagara Parkway. And you've taken a few photos along there. Birdie Hall, for instance, in uh, Fort Erie, where uh, former slaves would escape from the United States and, and cross the river uh, to land at Birdie Hall, where they would be taken care of by the Canadians and, and start their uh, journey to freedom in this country and in yes. this province. I yeah. love uh, that picture and the story of, of uh, Chloe Cooley that you talk about. Uh, being forced back from Ontario, back across the Niagara River to U New York State. That uh, was a heart-wrenching story. And again, you took a picture at that uh, that location. Yeah, it, it, it helps to visualize it because uh, people that live there would understand how steep the bank is and how, you know, the river is almost a mile wide there and how close the American side is. Um, but for people that beyond there, I, I, I wanted to illustrate how close she was to being in Niagara on the Lake, when she was sold to a new owner on the American side, they still had slavery just across the river. And slavery was about to be abolished in Ontario, or Upper Canada at the time. And her owner decided that he wanted to, while he could make money from her, made a transaction. And she knew what was going on because I'm sure that, that uh, black people up here that had been enslaved, and, and she actually was still a slave because it was before we introduced the uh, act to limit slavery. But the, the scuttlebutt was they may be eliminating slavery up here. And so some of the black people would have been excited about that, probably including a Chloe Cooley. So when she sold to a, a new owner in the United States, she kicked up a major fuss and it attracted so much attention that it went to the legislature and John Graves Simcoe and other members of the legislature, some of whom owned slaves, decided to enact the act to limit slavery, which would uh, gradually phase it out over a period of about 20 years. And that was the very first legislation to limit slavery or to ban it or to, to, to tail it out uh, in the entire British Empire. It wasn't until 1834 that Britain enacted the uh, Abolition of Slavery Act. So we were on the leading edge of that enlightenment. Yeah, and kudos to you for telling the story of her because she's a real heroine. And many... nobody knows her. People no, have not heard her name before, and she has a little wee plaque along the Niagara Parkway that you and I have whizzed past many times, I'm sure. And unless you're walking, you wouldn't see the plaque. Meanwhile, John Gray Simcoe, who, whose actions led to the, 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 the abolition of slavery, the gradual abolition of slavery, Lake Simcoe, Simcoe, Ontario, uh, Simcoe County, his name is everywhere. Chloe Coley, Clo excuse me, Chloe Cooley is on one little plaque and uh, yeah. it was her and we don't know what happened to her after she went back to the states we don't have no idea about her fate we know all about simcoe he went back to england they were going to give him another colony he took sick and died so but we have no idea what happened to chloe cooley and her uh story was so so important to, to upper canada to all of canada well uh, brian thanks to you for telling her story because people are going to know the story now and of course, as part of the British Empire, we have no pride in our history of involvement in the slave trade and in slavery. But uh, we do have pride, I think, or we should have pride that Britain and Ontario led the way in abolishing the slave trade in the world. And yeah. that's something that comes to, comes to the fore when we read your book. And I especially love the story about you know, Josiah Henson and the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin 
and the book that was written about that, which was also a catalyst for leading to the uh, abolishment of slavery uh, efforts in America. So that's a fascinating part of the story. I'll, I'll tell you, that's my favorite part of the book. And I can tell you that my grandparents lived in the Ridgetown area in Kent County. And at the age of about 10 or 11, uh, they took me to uh, see Uncle Tom's cabin and near Dresden, Ontario. And the impression that that made on me and, and seeing scenes from the book and, and scenes from the story of Josiah, Josiah Henson's life uh, just impacted me in a way that I'll never forget. Um, were, you, were you intrigued by his story as much as I was? Well, the most interesting thing of his story, I was familiar with it from earlier stories and earlier visits to the, uh, used to be called Uncle Tom's Cabin Historic Site. It's now the Josiah Henson Museum Historic Site. Um, but the thing that I learned in the course of that that was completely new was that the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was very influential, it was written by an abolitionist, Harriet Beecher Stowe. It was very, very influential. It sold widely and it was a... a, a uh, uh, pushed uh, the Americans toward abolition. Um, it's very interesting that it, uh, I found out in the course of my research that while he was thinking about the Emancipation Declaration, guess what book Abraham Lincoln had checked out of the Library of Congress and was reading for three or four months before he released the first draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. It was Uncle Tom's Cabin. So Josiah Henson, who was the model for Tom of Uncle Tom's Cabin and lived in Ontario, died in Ontario. His headstone is there near his, uh, his cabin in Dresden. Uh, his story was influential in bringing about an end to slavery in the United States. Yeah, it was. And uh, you, you describe uh, his life to some extent in your book. I'll just read a portion of it. Henson had been owned by a succession of men suffered a broken arm, two broken shoulders when beaten by a white man, injuries that left him maimed for life. At the age of 18, he heard his first sermon in Kentucky and was so moved he became a Christian and a Methodist preacher. In 1829, he tried to buy his freedom, but his owner betrayed him and instead arranged for him to be sold to an owner in New Orleans. And uh, it goes on and on and then talks about his break for freedom, heading north to the border, traveling through Cincinnati, and then walking northeast 450 miles to Buffalo and then crossing at the town of Fort Erie, as we described, probably landing at Birdie Hall that we mentioned earlier. Uh, just an incredible story. And then how this man who had been so beaten down by, by life and the evil of slavery, he rose above it and yep. uh, he became a real leader, not without some controversy, but, no, no. Uh, and again, his story became the basis for Uncle Tom's Cabin, the story that affected Abraham Lincoln, one of the catalysts for the abolition of slavery. And he, he was a leader, uh, and he was a figurehead, um, and he, his work was uh, very, very important, and it was recognized by, he was granted audiences with Queen Victoria and with United States President Rutherford B. Hayes. He was uh, hugely respected and was a, a major factor in, uh, in doing great things for, for black people and his legacy lives on. Yeah, for sure. So what do you hope to accomplish by telling these stories, Brian? I think basically just let people understand that the Civil War was not an American war. Yes, it was it took place in the States, but because we had front row seats to it and because we were so close to it, especially in Southwestern Ontario, there was all sorts of involvement that Canadians and Canada had uh, in that war and all sorts of implications for us. There were there all these, some of these people who came up here uh, wanted to build a new life uh, before the war and after the war. And we offered them uh, a safe haven, an attic, if you will. Um, in fact, I originally called the book Escape to the Attic, but uh, the finer minds than mine decided to talk about the Underground Railroad and Rebel Refuge, which captures it as well. But we've, we've acted as a sort of a relief valve for the American experiment uh, a number of times over the years. Well, here's the book again. I'll give it a final plug. The book <laughs> Thank has, you. Uh, I think the book has some incredible stories and really has wheels. How is it being received? Oh, I've had some absolutely excellent early reviews. Um, 
and the, the there's a whole industry about people that do early reviews and Goodreads and NetGalley and a, a number of other organizations that I'm just becoming familiar with. The early reviews have been like 4.8 out of 5 or 5 out of 5. You know, they have been absolutely wonderful. And I think it's because I'm, I'm addressing something that people just didn't know about before. It's not my take on things. It's I'm opening eyes to things that were going on. Um, and that people just wouldn't have known about and maybe haven't known about until now. There's a lot more research that needs to be done, but uh, I think uh, 60,000 books and only a handful that relate to Canada and the Civil War, I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's room for more stories. I had to leave out a lot of stuff, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, and there were more connections with London, um, as well as Niagara-on-the-Lake and Toronto and, the, and the Buxton and, and Dresden. There were I had to leave out stories, uh, and I didn't. I didn't get into enough of Africville in uh, Nova Scotia, for instance, which was another significant black community. It just okay, well, it's well, amazing. I'll, I'll stop you there. We're almost out of time, uh, okay. Brian. But you've done an incredible job on the book. I highly recommend it to everyone. And uh, we've lost Pierre Burton. Are you Canada's next Pierre Burton? <laughs> No, the, there will never be another Pierre Burton, but I, I, true, I do like trying to chronicle Canadian things in our history. So thank you. That's very kind of you. Well, keep up the good work. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for being on London Lights. Viewers, stay with us for more exciting episodes and go out and get Brian's book. You'll love it. I guarantee it. Take care. Thank you, Dan. Take care, Brian. Thank you, Dan. Much appreciated being with you.